I'm going to just show you uh, one more quick video here. We were looking at the ones on assertion and aggression and passive communication and all that and uh, negotiation skills. And this one, um, people asked us about same-sex relationships. Some of the schools are more open to that and others are discussing it. And again, I, uh, it's not in the curriculum. So what we do is some of the examples we use are same-sex relationships. And that way, we hope to normalize it and not make a big deal over it. So the kids just watch it. If there's chuckles and giggles about it, OK. There's going to be. But your best to um, just treat it like that, and, and as opposed to making a big deal out of it, I think. And these kids did a great job. These are drama students in grade 11. Um, they're not in a gay relationship. I mean, this, these are not, this is not a an actual couple doing this. This is two, two boys trying to um, show the similar problems that we, we've discussed in other situations, how to handle uh, jealousy and relationship issues. And I think they do a good job of it. Oh, hey, man. Where you been? Yeah, I've hey, been looking all over yeah, for like, um, i got to talk to you, OK? What's up? Just When we come to these things, OK, you just, you just get ridiculous, OK? You drink way too much, and you just do crazy things, and you embarrass me to the point where you don't even know what you're well, doing anymore. Well, of course anymore. I drink. It's a party. I know it's what a party, expect? but like you just do it way too much, and you just make me feel like an idiot, OK? I'm socializing. You're okay? socializing. Yes, I'm yeah. socializing. Yeah, that party. works. There's so many other ways you can socialize other than like making me feel stupid. How am I making you feel stupid? You're making I'm me feel stupid because you do other things, and you just like talk to other guys, and you make me feel like an idiot, OK? Oh, I talk to other guys. Yeah, because everyone, knows, everyone knows we're together, and they see you talking to other guys, and they're going to think bad things of you. I don't how, want... how is me drinking associated with you? Like, that's because we're together, obviously people are going to make assumptions and just, I don't know, you just embarrass me, okay? That's I'm all I'm trying to say. You. Yes. Okay, you just do stupid things, okay, when you drink oh, too much. Gosh. Okay, so you just do way too much and you're ridiculous. Okay, so I'm I can't sorry, do I'm it. sorry that I'm drinking at a party. There's yeah. just so many other things you could be doing. and Obviously you care more about the party and more about your booze than you do about me. Oh. So I don't know what we're supposed to do, okay? Well, so just, I don't even want to talk to you right now. Fine, just I don't whatever. care. Okay, okay, go. Okay, and then the kid has to decide, okay, what, what are you noticing there? And, and uh, they have to come up with aggressive. Um, that's the whole plan of watching these things so they can identify. The guy came on too strong. I didn't give him any solutions or a way to negotiate with it. So I'll show you one more here. Same ideas. So okay, bye. I'm going to go see a movie. With who? Mindy. Mindy. Yeah. That girl from math class that you're always flirting with. We're just going to go see a movie. Oh, she clearly has a huge crush on you. No, there's nothing there. The only reason I'm going with her is because you've already seen the movie. You're blowing me. I don't care if I've already seen the movie. You're blowing me off for another girl. Who's your girlfriend, me or her? You, but there's nothing going on. Well, it's not that obvious to people like me. I just sit here and watch you walk away and hang out with another girl. OK, you know what? You're upset. We're going to talk about this later, OK? We'll no, I'm not later. done talking to you. Get back here. OK, why don't we Pick another movie, get about a group of friends, and we'll all go see a movie later. Without her? No, like, it, there's nothing there. She's not coming. I don't like seeing you two together. But we'll be with a group of people. I don't care. She's still there, and she'll still be with you. OK, you know what? You're upset. There's nothing going on between us. But I'm late for this movie, so I'm going to call you when the movie's over, and we'll talk about it then. OK, so in this case, the girl on the right, what was she demonstrating for the kids? Pardon? Negotiation skills. You know, we'll pick another movie. We'll do something different. Um, negotiation skills are the highest level that you're going to get to with adolescents if you get there at all. And it's all about them being able to find an out without losing their relationship, which is typically just saying the hell with you and walking away. That, you saw some of those too. But it's all about negotiation. I want to be your friend. I want to do these things, but I'm not going to let you do that to me. So she was being assertive and, and saying there's nothing there and, and being negotiation saying, you know, if that bothers you, then we'll do something different. But I'm not going to not have friends. And same for male-female relationships, right? The, the girl may uh, want to have friends or do things with girlfriends or boyfriends or other guys, and the guy is too jealous. So that's it's a very critical skill for their relationship. One of the ones in the fourth hour that I like particularly that isn't demonstrated here, but it's a simple exercise in making an apology. And I wish some of our politicians would 
would have taken that uh, course, but just simply being able to um, admit your guilt or fault mistake and own it and being able to, to say to another party to practice that, you have no idea until you try it how difficult it is for a lot of people to be able to say, yes, you're right, I was wrong or I made a mistake or even though I was trying to do this, I did it the wrong way and I hurt somebody, I'm sorry for that. A very important lesson for adolescents because they don't see apologies much, right? It's all about the other stuff, about forcing the other people or being angry at them. So it's one of the exercises we had. And one of the biggest areas of conflict in adolescence is over breaking up, just like it is with adults. So why not teach them some of that? Why not teach them how to break up without hurting the other person, without damaging and trying to get back at them? So there's an exercise in that, which is kind of fun. Um, what would you say if you were going to break up with your girlfriend or boyfriend? How would you do it? Would you text them, which is very common today? You know, I've had enough of you. You know, do you do it by text? Do you leave them a voicemail? Do you do it face to face? You know, is, do you have the guts to actually explain uh, why you want to separate and what it means to you? Um, so very important because adolescents uh, aren't in permanent relationships. They're shifting day and night, and so they need to know how to change relationships without some ag aggression being a part of it by being able to say, I'm moving on, or I can see that this bothers you, I think we should you know, stop for a while. Being able to, to express how they feel about it, very tough. And for girls to express it to guys, the girls can express it better because they're better with verbal skills. The guys are, have a real hard time expressing it back because they don't have the verbal skills. They're afraid of that. Guys are afraid of girls' verbal skills, period. And so they get you know, angry and, and so forth. So, that practicing that, very important. And most couples know exactly how to push buttons, right? So one of the exercises is they write down the things that they think the, their girlfriend would really, um, really get them angry, right? And then you role play it, with, not with the girlfriend, but with someone else. So that um, if your trigger point is um, that you're just a cheater, then role play that, where the girl's gonna say to you, you're a cheater and always a cheater. And, so the guy's going to, he's going to have to get that emotional arousal because you have to put it into a real circumstance to feel what it feels like so you can practice it without getting aggressive. So moving on, we have the teaching learning strategies in action. I just want to show you a couple examples of what the, I can't do all the training here and show you everything that's in the class, but I wanted to give you a sense of it that um, a lot of what we do in all the 7th, 8th, and 9th, 4th R has to do with activities. So the kids have to, you know, it's like, like I say with uh, athletics, that you have to get up and do it and practice it. So they're given cards to sort and deal with like you saw. The other is the posted pile-up game, pilot game, which is kind of good. Um, if we had time, we'd do it here, but it's simply you get kids into, into a table together and they get post-it notes and you pose a situation and they write down what they would do and then they, they post it and they, then they can see how many kids agree with them or not. They, they stick it in the pile and then they look to see how many kids think like me and how many kids think differently than me and what's the value of the different thinking. It's just a way to get them to feel comfortable that um, my decision making is similar to other people and this is how I would handle it and see how other people handle it. A lot of things like that. Um, <clears throat> I know you can't read this, it's in your handouts, but this is just one of the exercises. Um, what the kids have to do in small groups is what does it look like when you see partners in a healthy relationship? What do you actually see when they're together? So getting them to think about this and they write it down and, and think it over and talk amongst themselves about it, very valuable, right? I mean, this is where learning happens so the kids can share this with each other. I'll read you a couple more. What does it look like when you see friends in a, in a healthy relationship? What do you actually see? So we want them to visualize that. Then over here, we want them to hear. What does it sound like when you see partners in a healthy relationship? What do you actually hear? And what do you see friends? What do you hear? What do you see kids and other kids with their parents? What do you actually hear? And over here, what do you feel? What, sorry, what do you think it feels like if you're in a healthy relationship with a partner or with, a, uh, with friends and peers? What does that feel like? 
and let the kids find their own words for that. It's very powerful for them. Okay? It, some will say it feels safe. It feels comfortable. It feels good. You know, that kind of thing. So you want them to visualize a healthy relationship um, so that they have more control over it, more understanding of it. They know what they're after. They know what to avoid. Okay? So they're much more clear in their language and in their understanding of it. I'm going to go over some of the findings here. I didn't, I didn't, uh, I plan to do them in the workshop as opposed to the, the noon talk um, because I knew we had a little more time. And I'm not going to go over in, in depth, but in fairness, I wanted to at least show you what we've found to date in the program, and then we'll come back and talk about the mental health aspects. The original grade nine version has been rigorously evaluated and it improves the positive functioning and reduces risk behavior. Um, the specific findings, what we did is, we assessed a group of, we had 20 schools, so half the kids received it, and half the schools received it, and half didn't. It's what they call a cluster randomized design. If you work with schools, it's the best way to go. You randomize the schools, you don't have to worry about randomizing individual kids, and then you control for school effects. You look at um, an interclass correlation to see if that there's any, something going on in that school that affects the kids more than other schools, and it's a more powerful way to look at it, and a lot less confusing. So. Half of them received it, half of the schools didn't. And then we, we did a, a pretest at the beginning of grade nine. So they're about 14 years old. They come in and they completed information about dating violence, um, substance use, other risk behavior, sexual harassment, um, attitudes and beliefs, and so forth and so on. But our main outcome was the um, dating violence aspect. And then we looked at them at post-intervention uh, towards the end of the first year. And we had observational data on a group of, um, I believe it was 200, yeah, 200 kids. So the whole cell size was close to 1,800 kids in all the schools, and we couldn't observe all of them. So we pulled out randomly 200 of them in a, a select four schools so that we didn't have to run all over to 20 schools. Pulled out 200 of them and uh, did a really cool thing. I liked it a lot. We had the actors, drama actors, set up in a classroom, and the kids in grade nine uh, went up and interacted with actors. I can't show you, show you those because obviously of ethical reasons, but they're really uh, fascinating to watch because the closest you can get to a real peer interaction, you know, sort of real life situation, how do you handle this without being there? It's contrived, and the kids knew that, but, and you can't watch them in the mall, and you can't have their friends report on them. So we did a role play with kids are in grade 11, the actors, like similar to the ones you saw here. And what they did is they had a role play. Um, the kids identified, we asked the older kids, what are the typical things in grade nine that you had to deal with that you think these kids you know, can demonstrate their skills? And for the boys, um, when they went up, they, the typical situation was pressure by older kids to join in and party and do bad stuff to kids. Bully them, harass them, you know, negative stuff about women, negative stuff about gays. That's the typical stuff that they had to deal with. And for women, it was about uh, sexual activity, you know, con trying to convince them to be sexually active and take drugs and drink and that kind of thing. So especially by older boys. So they set up a, a role play like this. The kids from grade nine went up in pairs. And why did we do it that way? First of all, they feel more comfortable. And second of all, we wanted to see how they interact with one another. So that, it was contrived. But kids don't interact around these things alone. They interact with a friend, usually. That's sort of the natural part of it. So they go into the room. It's just a three, or five, three to five minute interaction, some of the ones you've seen. The older kids will comment about going to a party. You know, I see you're on the grade nine football team. It's about time you guys joined us for the party. And of course, the, the kids are like, yeah, I want to be accepted. So they, they comment on that. So you lead them in. Kids are really good at this, right? And then, uh, so he agrees to go. And then, then they'll say, uh, can you bring some, some booze? And then the kid has to figure out what to do. Some of the kids would say, especially in the control group, yeah, I can get some booze for my parents. And others would say, uh, no, I don't want to drink. And then how do you deal with it? And of course, the pressure then that would occur from the older kids 
within ethical guidelines. You know, we couldn't, the older kids didn't badger them to death, but they would say, oh, come on, you know, just everyone has to bring something. Just grab something from your dad's liquor cabinet. You won't miss it, that kind of thing. And he'd say, no, my dad doesn't drink. Don't. Okay, and bring some money. You know, chip in 20 bucks. Or, no, I don't want, all that kind of thing. Well, then get some weed, you know. We'll get, and they just go on and on. And it's, it's hilarious to watch how they, how they deal with it. And to me, very revealing. So we took that data. Hundred of the kids have had the program, of course, and hundred hadn't. And we compared them on observational data, like what we actually saw blinded the kids, the people observing them uh, didn't know who had what. And um, let's see if I actually have that here. No. And what we did is the observers found that the kids that received the fourth R were demonstrating higher level skills, especially negotiation skills, in a real life but contrived situation. Um, so you actually could demonstrate that. So I thought, okay, that's good that we can, we can actually measure observationally that there's an effect, but would that effect also be seen by other people that, um, like teachers that know kids every day? So we gave the same tapes to teachers uh, who were not teachers of these kids, did not know um, who, what kids received the fourth hour. They were totally blind to it. And we just told them to watch the tapes and rate them on the skills that they're supposed to learn in grade nine, because they were grade nine teachers. And uh, so they knew what they're supposed to learn, how well were they demonstrating it. So that, to me, that was a great test, and that we found a very strong effect for the teachers, that they were rating our kids higher. So there's something going on. The kids are learning something, and the teachers are picking up on it. They see a different kid um, if they've received this, this, this material, and it's a kid who can handle pressure and deal with negotiation strategies, pressure around sex, drugs, violence, and uh, typically peer bullying and so forth. Uh, much better than the other kids. Then, um, then we follow those kids, let's see. We also take a look at the vulnerable youth here. We knew which of the kids had grown up with more maltreatment. Again, that's my background and interest was child maltreatment, so we, we asked that at baseline. Um, in terms of what kind of discipline methods parents use and that kind of thing, using the childhood trauma questionnaire. And then we uh, simply rank them according to those who would be considered above the threshold and below, because everyone says that they're hit now and then and yelled at and so forth. They had to fulfill the criteria and the test of being in the risk category. So you take that information, you divide them up, and how do they do versus the kids that weren't, um, that didn't grow up in those homes. And what we found is a a bit of a surprise, um, the, the schools that had, uh, that received the fourth R had kids that were reporting less delinquency and aggression uh, if they had maltreatment in the background. So in other words, those vulnerable youth, there's something they were gaining from, I guess you'd say a different school connectedness or environment, and they weren't two and a half years later in reporting as much delinquent act including we, those acts were right out of the C CDC inventory. It was carrying weapons to school, it was attacking other youth and hitting them, um, that kind of thing, uh, violent acts. So here you got kids who are considered most at risk is what they grew up with, and they were gaining even more than the other kids uh, from this type of lesson. I think they had the most to gain. They didn't know anything about healthy relationships, and as a consequence were showing fewer delinquent behaviors. So that was a surprise. We, that wasn't the main part of our RCT. It was most of, more of a post hoc to look at those kids. So here's the, um, that was post intervention, and then we followed those kids as well. Then two and a half year follow up, <clears throat> we had about 1,700 at follow up, end of grade 11. And what they, we found, they were able to make healthier choices. They re reported reduced dating violence especially for boys, the, the effect was stronger for boys and girls, and higher condom use if they were sexually active. So the subset of kids that said they were sexually active, girls and boys were reporting more condom use. So again, um, we're able to find that they're getting the message, they're keeping safer than the other kids. We didn't find an effect for substance use, and there's, I think, a good reason for that. When you saw those little charts or graphs, no, I guess I did that at noon, but there are charts and graphs about when kids start drinking and smoking marijuana, and, by grade nine, they're well into it. So the intervention for substance use, uh, first of all, is probably a little late. I think it should start in grade seven. And the experimentation in substance use is still high. 
So it may be a while before you really see an effect, if at all, uh, in di diminishing that. But the main part was that we're reducing violence. So, and if you want, there's in your handouts, all these publications are listed in, in terms of uh, uh, what I'm describing here in a follow-up. I just, I had mentioned this earlier, but the buffering effect for maltreated kids was still present at follow-up. We found it at, at the end of the year, and two, and, and two years after that, we found that they were still not engaged in the same degree of violent delinquency as other kids. So there's something they're picking up from this. And then the kids themselves, we had um, focus groups with a bunch of the kids to find out more uh, directly from their mouths, what did you get out of it? And that was kind of intriguing because the kids don't know the program is the fourth R. What we did is we, at the end of grade 11, it's been two years since they last completed the program in, in, in health class, we just got kids together and asked them, do you remember health class? Do you remember such and such? We'd give them a cue because they all remember some of these exercises. And then what do you remember about it? And they'd tell us and um, did it have any impact on them. And then you'd hear some of the stories about how they had to break up or had to tell their girlfriend or boyfriend how to deal with something, how to, a lot of counseling because that's where they get it from. So they were a lot of stories about, yeah, my girlfriend was, you know, was just going to leave my text and tell him to screw off. And instead of that, she came to me and we talked it over and she did it properly and, you know, could have avoided violence. And one girl reported how she got out of a violent relationship that she, you know, suddenly slipped into, realized what was going on and stopped it and got out of it. So, again, those are, to me, that's very valuable information. Hard to publish, but very valuable in terms of the, the um, importance of their voices in it. And then we look at how teachers find it. Uh, we were talking about this at lunch, and I've spoken to some of the others about it. Like, here's the thing about all these programs that we develop in psychology and social work and mental health uh, is they, uh, the translation of them is weak. We publish them, we put them on the shelf, and we say, well, I'm sure everyone's going to use this. And it doesn't translate. People don't pick it up. Sometimes years later, they do. And so we, we're still finding ways to disseminate and implement the programs um, so that it has a life. It was built to, to last within the classroom, within the school and the curriculum, but if I stopped doing it tomorrow, would it continue? And I'm not sure yet, but right now we have it in 5,000 schools across Canada, which we're very proud of, and we go back and we interview teachers and administrators and that to, to find out how to tweak it. This is the part that you may not learn in graduate school because it's, it's not what typically psychologists do. But if you're going to be in program development in any fashion, you have to learn about knowledge translation and how to keep it going. Otherwise, in this particular case, the issue of mental health we're going to talk about now uh, will we'll just <clears throat> pass us by. And they'll say, oh, we, we tried that back in 2014, but uh, it didn't work. And so let's, let's not waste our money on that anymore, right? And it didn't work because it wasn't done properly and with a proper evaluation. Comments on that before I move on? On the findings or anything? We have another trial in Saskatchewan we haven't published yet with grade eight, grade eight students. And then we're doing one this fall in grade seven. Mm -hmm. I have a quick question, going back to the previous slide. When you mentioned um, that you were doing um, the research on the um, maltreatment but, and you, you referenced the scale, would that, would that be the adverse childhood experience scale, or is that a different? It's a different one. That's a ranking of all the different adverse experiences. That would be another good one. Uh, the childhood trauma is more on, uh, it measures neglect, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse. And then we added family violence exposure to it. Mm -hmm. Did you publish the qualitative findings or not? Um, Claire has published some, Claire Crooks. Um, let's see. She she has, I believe, some in, in in this article here in the Canadian Journal of Community Mental Health in terms of the qualitative findings. Um, we have a lot of qualitative findings with our First Nations kids because that's how we assess them. They want to talk about it. They don't want to fill out questionnaires. And we haven't published that yet to see what experiences they've had and how it's benefited them. Um, we have a large Aboriginal program that was developed with them and uh, 
the difference, the primary difference is they said to us, if you're going to teach this in our communities, we have to start with the premise of colonization of American Indian. And I thought, okay, you know, you're absolutely right. You can't talk about violence and um, um, equality and so forth without first talking about what they've gone through and not blaming themselves for it. So they wrote this terrific introduction to it so that youth hear how they view it and then it's taught by their own teachers. So we'd like to have an African-American version of that too. I think that that's in, in Hispanic and different cultures, everyone has to bring in their own culture and say, in our culture, there's certain problems we have. We have to kind of understand those problems. Uh, for example, um, alcohol use, for example, violence, absent dads. We have to look at that and say that it's not because of our race, it's not because of any of that, it's because of the situation our ancestors have tried to cope with. And as a consequence of that, um, there's still a lot of problems. And that helps the kids identify that it's, that, that, you know, that I'm not earmarked from the beginning as having more problems because of my gender or my race. When we, when we do disseminate or implement the program in different areas, like I say, we, we encourage people to develop it locally, use the language that works best for them, use their own kids in the videos but also make sure that it matches culturally the, the message that those parents and teachers want to give. So ideally, it doesn't always happen, but ideally, if a school board was going to use a program in all their grade seven or eight classes, then a curriculum ex expert for the school board would look at it to make sure it matches curriculum. And then a parent um, person from the school board, the parent council person, or other people that uh, would influence the curriculum in terms of their cultural, does, is it the right message for our, for our board and that would go through it and make those changes and say, let's, let's, let's tweak it. That's all, we designed it that way. We designed it so it can be tweaked. We designed it though so that you don't pull out certain things that you don't like, like uh, role plays, just because you, you don't want to do them. Then you'd be killing off the program, but you can certainly make it fit better for the kids that you work with or you're teaching. All right. <clears throat> Pardon me. Any of you operate or work with ap after school programs? Maybe you did back there. Any others? Mm -hmm. Yep. The US has more after school programming than, than Canada does. I'm not sure why. My friend that's a teacher says it's because. Uh, the busing, like the, the buses in Canada leave at a certain time and then they have to have other ones for sports and athletics, but they don't leave room in the afternoon for that. But here apparently it's more common. So they asked us, they being a group in Seattle a few years ago, to, if we could develop something they could do outside of class time. And we called it Healthy Relationships. It was a small groups program as opposed to the classroom. And now what I'm going to do <clears throat> is shift into a bit of discussion of how we teach mental health to these kids. We now are doing it in the classroom in grade seven. Um, but in the after school, we can do more of it. We have more flexibility with it and, uh, you know, more time, I guess, to do it. The Healthy Relationship Plus was when we added in the mental health and well-being component to it. And it's just undergoing a full evaluation this summer with a group of about 300 kids to see if we can demonstrate a year later that they do have more health and well-being. Uh, they feel better, they're coping better than kids that don't go through the program. The whole, that's the whole idea here, is roughly between ages 13 and 16 to help them get through these critical, critical times and feel good about who they are. So Healthy Relationships Plus is an enhanced mental health and suicide prevention version. Because suicide prevention is also big, I'm sure it is down here, because of the tragedies that have occurred. Um, some internet bullying related and wh whatever it may be, but kids have to have some information about this in terms of mental health. It's taught by community professionals in small groups. It's not done by teachers typically, so it's anyone. It could be uh, counselors, anyone who works with youth that's comfortable dealing with uh, after school program. It's 
skills to prevent violence, bullying, unhealthy sexual behavior, and substance use, just like we talked about in the school. Um, it develops critical thinking, self-awareness, and problem solving, and promotes healthy attitudes. So those are really the, again, similar to the classroom, but done in a small group. <clears throat> now the sessions themselves, We try to keep it, these are hour long sessions and we try to keep it a reasonable time because of, of the nature of adolescence. So getting to know you and then um, they talk about friendships, shaping our views, influences on relationships, what healthy relationships are, then the warning signs, knowing your values and boundaries, communication skills, taking responsibility, standing up for what's right. When friendships and relationships end that I mentioned what to do emotional health and well-being, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, and how to help our friends. Like They are the best help providers uh, to get the kids to the next level, to help them navigate, what do I do now? Okay. So generally, um, uh, because it's small group, they can do a lot of role playing. They can do more discussion and more activities than they, than they might be able to do in a classroom. And you have more freedom over that. Now, why are we discussing mental health? Now, as I present this, I want you to put yourself in the place of um, an adolescent who might be learning this material. I want you to think like that and think, you know, the, the concepts here are familiar to us. What's not familiar to us as mental health professionals is how do you teach it to kids? That's what I'm trying to say. So if you were to teach mental health to an adolescent, health and well-being, what would you do? How would you do it? So for the next few minutes, what I'm going to share with you is our vision of how you would do this if you're either a teacher or you're a counselor after school, because um, we're doing it now in grade 7 as well. I said this morning that you wouldn't teach about pathology and illness and mental disease, okay? But what would you teach? And how would you get them to understand what healthy, mental development is all about. So that's what I want you to do for a minute. Okay. <clears throat> so why are we talking about a mental health program? So when we teach the, the counselors or teachers how to deliver this, we remind them that first of all, many, many mental health issues surface during adolescence or young childhood. They say 85% of adult mental disorders had an origin in childhood and adolescence. So those of you here in your childhood and adolescence program can feel proud of that because in the past, it's been the, the poor child of adult mental health. And most people in adult mental health didn't care, really care where the origins was. Let's deal with it now. You should have dealt with it a long time ago. It's a lot worse now. Um, these things don't appear in adulthood. They, they gradually appear um, either in childhood or adolescence or both. And they grow worse over time. So why wouldn't we be uh, introducing this concept so that people that are suffering from it or the adults that notice it have an idea what to do about it and not wait till it's a crisis, which is how we've always done it in the past. Depression and anxiety are common among high school age youth. How common is it? Anyone know? Pardon? 70? For which? Both? Yeah, probably if you added both. And, and if you're not talking about disorder, but you're talking about symptoms. Sometimes it's a bit misleading because when they ask these, they publish in the paper, you know, like they did a big survey of the Toronto School Board recently and close to 70% said that they were either, you know, had feeling anxious in the past week or, and, and or feeling sad or depressed. And then parents say, what? You know, can't be that bad. But the reality is that these are symptoms that for some will turn into disorders and that's not our, our main core, uh, issue now. The main issue now is helping them with to deal with what's normal, right? And understanding what these feelings are and how to, under, how to uh, help your friend who might be cutting themselves, who might be doing self-defeating ac actions, might be um, showing signs of disorder. Let's talk about that so that they can help one another. Suicide's the second leading cause of death. And I'm sure it's similar in the US, second only to car accidents. So again, suicide's something that no one talks about. They still don't put those names in the paper. It's considered a shameful. Um, so 
we don't want to talk about it at all, but kids have to talk about it because they're the ones, they're the sentinels that are going to see the signs from their friends. All the, the teen suicides had signs. People just didn't pick up on them and thought someone else will see it. Not my job, no big deal, or in some cases, I want to see him do it. You know, it, that's like I said earlier, that if, if you type in, I want to kill myself, you'll get comments about how to do it and egging you on to do it. So we've got to talk about it. If you to know, uh, kids have to feel comfortable. Um, they're not therapists, but they're sentinels, and that they have to be able to say to their parents or a teacher or an adult that I'm really worried. Okay. We always, part of this is helping the parents and adults, they get information, helping them to understand how to talk about sensitive topics with their kids. Okay. And one of the things we teach them is uh, you don't have to, put it on your kid because they won't talk about themselves. Like, you know, it's very hard for a parent to say, have you ever felt suicidal? Or do you ever do this? Do you ever feel this way? But it's really easy to say, do you know any friends that do? Have you have any, have any of your friends felt that way? Have you ever, any of your friends done that? And the kids are more comfortable to say, because they're worried about the friend, yeah, what do I do? Mm -hmm. I think um, one of the problems that I've seen just on the, on the high profile cases, because we had a case in here that um, the teenage boy told his friend who lived like in the neighborhood that he really wanted to kill his dad. And she knew, and I think what, what I'm trying to say, and then he actually ended up doing it, and now he's on trial. But what I think, and then if you interview, you see the interviews with the other students, yeah, he had a list, or yeah, he said something. But as we know in the adolescent mind, they, Right. Their no thinking gonna, is different, right. and they might not think it's a serious thing, or, oh, he's joking. You know, I, I mean, he has a list, but it's not as, he's not going to do it or whatever. Because I think that's the, their thinking, that it's, it's really not going to happen. So I think one of the things we, we need to be, is for them to recognize when something's really escalating, or it's a joke, you know, I'm going to kill you, or there's a list, there's a specific time, there's a plan. You know, this kid had said, I have a rifle, I bought a gun, you know, whatever. So I think it's helping the youth that we know their brain are not fully developed. And recognizing when something is really, really serious, you should really talk to somebody about what your friend Johnny is saying. You know, I feel this is going to be something serious because mm -hmm. that's what I've noticed. I don't know if anybody else has noticed that. But I think it's just have, helping them recognize when somebody's really talking about that they have a plan or whatever, you really need to tell somebody or try and help that person or... Yeah, and we. Or whatever. I don't. I don't know if I just do get what I'm saying is that yeah. helping them recognize sometimes it's serious. It's, it's a tripwire in in our system, so you know it's either it's not serious or you call nine one one, and they don't want to trip that wire. So, um, what we're trying to teach them are some of the warning signs and what are the things to say or do, not to take responsibility for it, other than. Um, talking it over with someone. So the message is always, just like it is in psychology, if you're not sure, ask a colleague. Always talk about it. But the other part of it is to destigmatize it, to stop making it into a joke. Because anytime anyone talks about themselves at all, girls are better out than guys. But if a guy were to say um, how, he, you know, how angry he might be, or more typically, uh, if he has any vulnerability, saying you know about how he feels <clears throat> he is putting himself in a dangerous position because the other kids know something about him and they can use it so they can post it they can badger him and hassle him so kids boys don't do that very much and girls are cautious as well so what we want to do is take away the joking part of it to, so they realize that these things um, aren't you know it's just people that are crazy at any one time you or your friends are going to experience some of these feelings they're not pleasant, and if it was you, you'd want someone to be concerned and help you. That's a simple message. Not to laugh at you, not to call you names that you're crazy, stupid, or, or weak. Um, and that simple message is all we want to get across. And also that um, it's not your responsibility to decide if they're going to commit suicide or hurt anybody. It's your responsibility to tell an adult if, you're con if there's any concerns, any worries at all, and let that adult take it from there. And hopefully the adult won't just do the tripwire thing and overreact and you know, escalate something. Um, the idea is that you 
the next level is someone talks to the kid and doesn't just call the police unless it's really urgent. <clears throat> so all of these cases of shootings, all these cases of suicide, all these cases of homicides involving adolescents had warning signs almost every time. And the Sentinels weren't doing the job. No one thought it was their job to do, didn't know what to say, didn't know what to do, or they teased them. And that only provoked it and led, and led to a faster a disaster. <laughs> so um, that's what we're trying to get across here. And it's common for the kids to report these symptoms. That's the other part of it. Mm -hmm. Usually in a group, before you go into the group, you tell them, you know, the standard statements, tell me if you hurt yourself, or somebody else, you got to report that. How do you deal with that in your groups? Do you still make that statement? Oh yeah, we, we still are under the obligation if they say that someone's hurting them that we have to report it. We always do mention that in the beginning, um, that if they're in danger hurting others or someone's gonna hurt them, we, we're gonna do something about that. If in the course of the groups, they reveal something about themselves that you as a counselor are concerned about, you make sure you do something about it, like in any group, um, even if it's just early warning signs. So a kid, No, because again, it's um, you have that safety of feeling you're here to the group, in the group to talk about these things and bring up things. And if we're concerned about you, we're going to try to help you, but we're not going to make you do something, drag you to the hospital. Um, that hasn't happened, but I guess it could. Um, so they want to feel safe in talking about these things. And the biggest obstacle for kids and adults in talking about mental health issues is a feeling that they're safe and talking about it. Can I really tell you what worries me and what makes me angry or what, you know, whatever without you thinking I'm this or I'm that and you're gonna, you know, take over. So they have to play with these concerns and talk about them amongst themselves in a safe environment. And adolescents are typically not safe. You know, they're, they're gonna take information and use it for their status and post it. So that is, um, an essential ingredient of it that, that they're told. They cannot share that outside the group, and they don't. They respect that after the first session. They realize that um, that's part of our discussion. And if kids, it's not a therapy group, keep in mind. So if there are kids in that that are clearly in, in bigger need, we move, we quietly move them on. Uh, they can continue in the program, so no one knows that they're also getting other help. But you don't want a kid in there that is actively suicidal, actively uh, homicidal or actively depressed and so forth, and isn't getting the mental health needs that they need. This is this is a for every kid, not for kids with current problems. <clears throat> so we we bring that we we really bring that out for the teachers and for the counselors. Is that their job is to educate the kids around this and bring any other concerns to our attention or any other uh, the school's attention so that they can work with it. Um, and it doesn't happen often, but they have to be prepared. Because if you're teaching this stuff, you are now the touchstone for any kid in that school to be able to come to you and feel safe talking about it. You've now said, it's okay to talk about it, so be prepared that they may come to you for that. More than half the people struggling with depression and anxiety don't seek help. So that's another reason why we're teaching this to adolescents is they don't, if they sought help, it goes on their record, it does actually in their health record, it can actually affect your employment. It's, it's pathetic about some of that. Um, that it can you go, you know, right now they're talking about uh, mental health with gun control. And there's a lot of people worried that if I go and talk to a counselor about feeling depressed, that I can't have a gun. <laughs> and in some cases, that's true. Um, there's still incredible stigma blocking people from seeking help. And the way that's going to be decreased is by the, these kids learning from an early age that that's what you do. Just like when you got a, a horrible stomach ache that hadn't gone away for four days, you better seek help. And don't just think you're weak and you're going to be teased and bullied if you do. We try to get across to the kids that they, the ones in the program are the strong kids that are there to teach the other kids. Uh, remember, it's empowerment. It's youth empowerment programming. So um, the model here is you're, you're the kids that are going to be more aware of these things than other kids and more capable of stopping some of the harassment and stigma and more capable of being um, a helper. That's all we want you to be is a helper. <clears throat> Most mental health issues are diagnosable and treatable. 
and they can and do recover. So people need to know there's help. You know, if I do go in, it won't just be a black abyss and they'll put me on meds and strap me to a, a gurney. Uh, the, the stigma around mental health is still horrible. Um, so they have to understand what it really is involved for that. Okay. So this part, I just wanted to go back to this for a second about the depression and anxiety common. Uh, when you ask kids these questions about how they feel and whether they've experienced certain feelings of anxiety and that, you do get very high rates. doesn't mean they are anxious or depressed, but it's typical, it's common. So they need to talk about it and feel that I share this. Other kids have this feeling too, not just me. And that's very important to recognize. So this is sort of the, the rationale behind it. Now, let's do a little exercise. Get up and we're going to do burpees. Um, here's what we would do with the, with the people teaching the group so that they can do these exercises with the kids in the group. As we ask them the simple question, what does it mean to be mentally well? So what is mental wellness made up of? Think about it for a minute and we'll see if we cover, see if, the, if your thoughts will cover what we think. This is, remember, this is how we're trying to, to translate uh, information about mental health that we go to PhD programs to learn into language that's so straightforward that you can tell it to a 15-year-old and they, they get something from it. Not so easy. So what does it mean to be mentally well? Mm -hmm. You have to be able to control your emotions like even if something is good, you know, being able to control the, the, the positive feeling is what helps you stay away from things like drugs or alcohol or taking risks. And then on the other end, if you're sad, you need to be able to pull yourself up. So being able to kind of get, like, get control of your emotions, because everyone, ha even people that are doing well, have a range. Right. So you could say emotion regulation. Uh, the ability, part of being, of well-being is regulating your emotions so that they don't take over. So it's controlling them and it's also recognizing that it's just an emotion. Right. That'll help you feel well. What else? Mm -hmm. okay. Being a life that's balanced between your work, your relationships, uh, things that you enjoy. Right. So some degree of balance. It's, we were talking about this at dinner last night, that, that it's all about um, doing what you enjoy and, and, and some of the things you don't enjoy so much. It's all about the balance and making sure that you're not uh, overstressed with it. Mm -hmm. And enjoying positive sense of self that enables that individual to navigate a variety of different um, personalities and situations relatively well. Okay, so how can we, how can we uh, summarize that, the sense of self? Okay, an enduring positive sense of self mm -hmm. that Let's generalizes to a variety of situations. Let's call it self-awareness, okay. for lack of anything better, but an ability or a sense of, of uh, who you are in relation to other people. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Where does empathy play a role if you feel that it does in all of what we've learned today? Where do you feel it plays a role? Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you. Um, well, I've been doing this long enough to know when I'm lobbed an easy one. <laughs> I think it is the, um, the glue, the element that we started with this morning about connections and relationships, that when we allow ourselves to be connected and in relationship, we have, we develop the capacity to have empathy. Right. And having empathy, we care about the people that we are interrelated with. That's right. So empathy for in adolescent speak is just being aware that uh, how other people might feel. That's it. It's very basic. It wouldn't be empathy, perhaps, the way you and I think of it, is really caring about or really understanding the other person, but at least the sense that that person has feelings yeah. 
and that's very important, of course, if you're talking about bullying and such. Um, the other component of that uh, that comes up is, and it's a tough one for uh, a lot of people, especially adolescent boys, is a sense in order to have intimacy or closeness, you have to be vulnerable. Okay, and I don't know how many of you, you know, r run into that in your classes and courses, but uh, intimacy blockers are the things where people don't want people to get too close because they're vulnerable. And anyone who's been scarred in life will know what I'm talking about because they'll be hurt again. Um, it, by intimacy, I'm not talking about sexual intimacy, but the ability emotional. to emotional intimacy for someone to get to know you and you trust them with that knowledge. Very t tough to do, one sec. Very tough to do and um, you don't expect 16 year old boy to have that, but at least you want to start raising um, in, a, in discussions of mental health around the table with kids what it means to be vulnerable because that's that they do get. Okay, I'm not gonna talk about that. If I mention that, it gets around school and they all call me names, right? And that's terrible vulnerability. So when they have dating relationships, they can open up a little bit more to their girlfriend. And then the, if the girlfriend really wants to tear the guy apart, tell the guys what he's really like. And then you gotta deny it all and you know, it's horrible. You can destroy a person simply by the knowledge of what you, they've told you in their close relationship. So kids fight that back and forth. That's part of it. Um, and then the notion of intimacy itself, whatever they want to call it, the feeling that you are, why, well, we did that on the board kind of, what's a healthy relationship? Why do you feel comfortable with that person? It could be your cousin. But we start that way, not with dating partner. Who's the person you feel comfortable with? Doesn't have to be your mom or dad. It could be your coach. You know, I know I can go to my coach and tell him something. He listens, he responds, and he cares about me. Or a counselor in the summer or camp. That's what we're looking for. Can you identify someone that cares about you and isn't manipulating you? Because damn it, you know, there's too much of that. The kids, vulnerable kids, and they get abused. So someone who um, they care about, what is it about that person? And help them identify that. Uh, they're there for me. They know how I feel. They, you know, they wouldn't use empathy, but they know how I feel. Um, you know, so it's the closest to love they can express at that age. That's exactly what it's all about. And you want to build on that. You want them to know that, yes, they probably, everyone has someone like that, but they hadn't really identified how important that person is to them. Uh, usually when we have those discussions with adolescents, it's not the parent that they talk about, because they're in a point where their parents are a little, you know, iffy. You know, I, I don't want to tell my parents too much, right? So an aunt, it's a great one because the aunt knows, hey, you know, he's 15. I know what he's doing, um, and he doesn't want his mom and dad to know. So, talk to me about it. I don't tell them unless I think you're going to be hurt. You know, then if I have to, I will. That's a great aunt behavior, uncle behavior. So they usually identify someone else in their family, extended family, or older brother, someone they can do. So, you had a comment. I just wanted to add um, when you were talking about gender roles and how kids grow up. You know, the boys have to play with. Army stuff, or the you know Indian and the girls with the dolls, or whatever. But I think also that that stigmatism is the you know boys aren't supposed to cry. That's a vulnerability. You're a sissy, whatever. So I think you know we have to you know kind of. I know it's really hard in the teenage years. You don't want to see you know, that, but I just think that that's one part of the societal things. You know, boys don't cry. You can be a man. Don't be. A, what, what always irritates me in teaching this stuff, first of all, there's not enough men teaching it. And so it's very tough to, um, to really get a movement going around these concepts. And then it, the, uh, the opposing view that we're turning men into girls uh, is very distressing because there are people, a lot of men out there, I think, um, hopefully not the majority, but to believe that if we really are trying to teach these concepts to boys that we're making them like girls. It's the worst, you know, it's, which is to them the worst thing you can do. Destroys them. And yet, <clears throat> um, it's a fundamental reason why we have so much violence. It's because they think they can't have empathy, they gotta have power. So these are the issues that we all know are critical uh, and we're trying to teach it to kids and, and sometimes the pushback is that we have an agenda of some kind to make men into, you know, to make it unisexual and so forth. And that's not it at all, it's just, 
there's, there's too much gender-based stuff going on because people are rigid thinking I got to be this way. And boys, you can almost feel the relief with boys, especially some of the ones that are bound up in the gender stuff and feeling like, geez, I don't have, you know, I can be a little vulnerable. I don't have to always be the tough guy and act a certain way. Okay. So we've got emotion regulation. We have self-esteem as part of health and well-being. What else? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. The ability to set goals, to organize your thoughts and activities to achieve those goals, <coughs> um, and uh, to be able to accomplish what you need to accomplish. Right. Just exactly. So planning. What we so we talk about emotion. We talk about sort of intrinsic, and, and that part is cognitive. Being able to plan and um, follow through and structure things and organize. Absolutely, that's part of health and well-being. Others? Tempering nature of feelings. Tempering what? The tempering nature of feelings. For instance, anxiety. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be all, you know, getting them to understand that, yeah, even a no healthy person gets anxiety, and it's a temporary thing, and it goes away. So if it doesn't go away, then I know, I'm aware that, that I can reach out and reach out to help for somebody. Right. That's right. So the ability to be able to talk about the, the fact that it's a universal phenomenon, we're all human, and being able to say it's part of our emotions. There's times when they get the better of us, um, but that's what emotions are there for, is to you know, let us know when something you know, might uh, be tricky or difficult. So anxiety is a good thing. You know, it works in your favor. Just you have to learn how to manage it. Those are the concepts um, the kids need to know. Any others? Mm -hmm. Well, all of the things that we're talking about this is very important, but I think also um, identify feelings and uh, identify our own needs as a human being. Mm -hmm. Because whatever is good for you, maybe it's not good for me. So I think it's very important adolescents, they need to identify why they, what they want it to be, what they need, what, and how to meet those needs in an appropriate way. Yes, I think that goes with what this woman was saying, sort of the being able to think about what your values are and what your plans are um, and, uh, and follow through on, be true to yourself in that respect. It's a big part of it. So let me show you what, how we've done this. I mean, you've pretty much captured it. But again, what we're trying to do here is translate into simple language so people can explain it to adolescents and they can get, grasp it. And so one of the things that we use is this. We have the kids do this at the table and post it in pilot types of things in terms of um, who agrees with this statement. And they post it and, and pile it. Um, and who disagrees, to see who disagrees. Those are all helpful things. And so th this is our little diagram. Sorry for the red, doesn't show up very well. <clears throat> Mental wellness, having good supports. No one mentioned that so much, your support network. Dealing with stress. Very simple language now we're using, right? Having a positive outlook and self-esteem. Got that one. Knowing how to access help when needed. That's not all of it, and we're gonna, and there's more here in a minute, but that's a big part of it. This is what we have to capture. It's not that difficult, so when you break it down for them, they can understand that, you know, it's not that being mentally healthy is, doesn't mean you have to, you know, have some resources that no one else has. So. Um, Critical ones, which ones of these things do they have control over? Good supports, dealing with stress, positive outlook, knowing how to access help. All of them, <laughs> right? All those things you have some degree of control over uh, if you want to. So we want to get them away from the thinking that I can't because my parents, my school, my this, my that, um, I can't cope or I can't. I can't connect well with others. So that's, that's one way of looking at it. Now, the next question is what kinds of issues get in the way of emotional health? If you're, again, you're explaining this to teenagers, what do you think they're going to come up with? What gets in the way of these things? Why can't we have mental wellness? So this is an exercise they would do at the table. Mm -hmm. Uh, was in a program where we provided counseling to kids from the juvenile justice system, <coughs> impoverished area, 
And I asked the kids, why, why do you have the outlook that you have on life? And the answer was, because I'll be dead by the time I'm 25. So what's the point? Yeah. So I don't know how you translate that into the language, but that was something, because it was a reality of the community that they lived in. Right. Hopelessness. Hopelessness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. There's another program now that I use doing this called Positive Action. The whole premise is based upon self-concept, based upon how you see yourself in terms of how one behaves. And um, because usually in those communities, people feel the way they feel because of much of what the students are saying to you. But when we have a, a, the components to positive youth development available in the community, it is a challenge to have those kind of safety nets things in the community. I'm, I'm, I'm preventionist, but I don't always believe that those are the bigger picture that we honestly want to see change because there's so much money made on the criminal side of what he is doing. Yeah. So it's kind of hard to say that in public, but that's really where, so you have this group of kids you work with, you just do the best you can with them, but, but that program was working pretty good to deal with the self-esteem issues and teaching children the day-to-day -day steps of what it takes to be successful. Well, I think you've, you've raised one of the things that gets in the way of mental health, and that's the system or you know, external factors, very much so. Hmm? You first. A lack of coping skills will probably interfere with Right, the lack of skill could interfere with mental wellness, not knowing how to handle it, so you end up getting swallowed up by it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's in this, in the first question or the present question, but can we teach resiliency? Mm -hmm. Yes, we can. But resiliency typically means, in the strict sense of the word, word that you're unscathed or untouched by stressful situations that would affect other people. Um, we use it in psychology to mean that we can build resiliency, that somehow you can teach those skills so they be like a resilient kid who just seems to do it magically. But absolutely, um, I mean, it's fundamental that if you want to get rid of bad, you increase the good, right? So that's what we're trying to do, build up more strength because you can't get rid of all the bad. Other, other roadblocks? Mm -hmm. Pardon? Not able to trust somebody to go to, so not having, or having bad relationships or no relationships. Right, so lack of supports, um, lack of resources that they can trust, yep, gets in the way with it. Mm -hmm. Stressful environment? Stressful environment, yeah, absolutely. Overwhelming stress. The, remember the whole thing about stress is being able to cope with the amount that you have. And in some circumstances, you shouldn't have to. Like it's, when I studied child maltreatment, I thought it's really wrong to try to teach the, co the kids how to cope with a, a family situation that no one should have to cope with. Because they will adapt, kids will cope and adapt. And then what do you got? A kid that's learned to be a victim and a victimizer because they've adapted. So we have, to, we have to have the ownership to reduce some of those stresses and at the same time build up their resilience and well, capabilities. So other, Roadblocks. Mm -hmm. Do you cover like sleep, diet, hygiene, or do you leave that to like a health teacher or some other? Is that it's not in the program, but it comes up from time to time. So that, of course they can talk about that. They, if they say I can't sleep because of this or that, uh, or the importance of sleep for adolescents, um, but I don't believe it's in the actual curriculum uh, or in our actual program but it is part, it's important. In the grade eight and grade seven, we have healthy eating components and they bring up a lot of, in, in terms of heating, heating, eating, and, uh, and we can deal with eating issues in terms of relationships as well, because a lot of kids abuse eating because of it. So what kind of issues get in the way of good mental health? In a way, it's kind of the opposite of what we just looked at, but you got violent and unhealthy relationships affect your mental health. These are all the risk factors. Lacking the coping strategies you mentioned, poor self-esteem, so the person's history of relationships and how they deal with people is weak, so they don't know really how to approach the new ones, and feeling disconnected. 
from others. Whoops. In communities where there's a lot of shootings, what would be a good approach to try and deal with resiliency in that group of children where there's drive-by shootings, shootings every few days when the news somebody even got shot? How do you try and deal? What would you suggest? <laughs> yeah. Um, if, the, if the kids um, are connected to that environment, they can't get out of it, their families can't get out of it, um, then uh, I guess my approach would be to help them connect with people they feel safe with. And even though their environment poses a lot more risk, um, they may be able to connect with groups or situations where they do feel safe and reduce the chance of harm, um, but recognizing it's not their fault as to why those things happen. I mean, you're, you're talking about you know the deep end, really problem areas that uh, should be dealt with by governments in that. And we can't leave it on the kids to just somehow be resilient. But we can help them build skills so that they can work towards an exit strategy. That's, you know. Now there's a little bit more to what, can, what issues can get in the way of good mental health that we haven't talked about. What's missing from this picture? You psychologists in the room. What else interferes? You touched on it. No examples. Pardon? No examples of good mental health in the community. Right. Because I, even with the, um, if, if, if everybody you see in the community has dysfunctional relationships and poor coping skills, it's what you model. You know, you may be resilient and, 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 and learn to adapt to that environment, but if you have never seen an appropriate model, you have no clue of what it is. Right, and that, I guess I would put that under this concept, though, but, I, but there's, there's more to it here that we're kind of missing. Mm -hmm. genetic, <coughs> genetic predispositions. We've been talking a lot about environmental things, but there are also biological factors. There are, but don't tell that to the kids because then they'll, they'll think they're earmarked and we can't do anything about them, at least not, not right away. But you're right, they, they do get in the way, they predispose. And discussions of that are, are worth having with kids in terms of, you know, my dad had this, my mom had that. What's my risk? They do need to know some of that so they don't think they're a walking time bomb especially in abuse cases. They think, you know, they hear that the biggest predictor of abusing others is you were abused. So how do I stop that? How do I break that cycle? But there's more. Cultural norms. Pardon? Cultural norms. Yep. Exactly. Cultural norms. <coughs> okay. Well, when we're thinking about how to explain what gets in the way of, of uh, mental health and well-being for, for adolescents, and you're trying to explain them, it to them. You're talking about these basic things, which they can do something about. The risk factors, we heard about that at lunchtime too. I, I went over all the risk factors. Um, but there are certain things they can't do something about, but they, and they can blame and, and it could keep them from, from being um, self-directed. And those are these things. Racism and discrimination, intergenerational trauma that I mentioned, poverty and lack of opportunities, which all go along. They all are interconnected, they're not unique. If you got one, you probably have the others. So that's the reality of it, and the kids now you know, can see, okay, mental, this is what mental well-being is. These are the things I might have control over, and I have to recognize that I may have more issues to deal with here than you might have. If I'm um, African-American descent, I may have more issues, have more things to face because of racism and discrimination in our country than someone else. If I'm, um, if I'm living on the south side of Chicago, I may have lack of opportunities and poverty, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. So there's, all that stuff has to be taken into consideration as, uh, uh, as reducing um, one's ability, increasing the risk factors. They get in the way. And they're the things that we are trying to change at a societal level. We don't expect the adolescents to, but we have to acknowledge them. We have to 
they have to be able to say, yeah, that's the world I live in, right? Or that my parents live in. And that we're trying to change, and gradually there's change, but it's still there. So it's harder for you than it might be for you because of these factors. Mental health and well-being, it's, it's factored in by all that. Now, <clears throat> so that's the exercise in terms of getting to think about that. And then I'll go over a few things we can do to help them uh, to work on that. We need to help them understand what causes uh, a mental issue, health issue or mental illness. And this gets back to the genetic stuff and everything. We give them a, a basic primer in terms of what, uh, what things cause mental health because they don't know anything about it. And they think it's, it's just you're crazy. There's something wrong with you. You're possessed, whatever it may be. It's very naive and, and ill-conceived. So you have to be able to educate kids a little bit about where these things come from, just like you would with health. So certainly you can talk about genetics. So we do talk about um, the, the, the influence of genes, not you know, just in basic terms of you do inherit half of your genes from each parent. So you, you know, that we're learning more and more about these things. And then you ask them, does that mean that it's inevitable? Our dream, a genes kind of an on-off switch? Will you get it if you're mom or dad had it. And so they understand how genes interact with, uh, with the environment. <clears throat> then we have to talk about the psychological factors that, um, that cause or trigger mental illness, hormonal and chemical imbalances, that there's in some, disease, some disorders and diseases, um, there's not strong knowledge in terms of biochemistry. We'll talk a little bit about traumatic and stressful life events that can cause uh, anxiety disorders and mood disorders in particular, that these things are triggers. Unhealthy and abusive relationships, drug and alcohol use, with the point being any of these factors alone or in combination can cause or trigger. So again, it's, uh, it's in simple language. How do you translate this to adolescents? What are the main themes you want them to get? Well, you want them to feel uh, optimistic that they can do things about it and yet uh, understand the realities of, of mental health issues. Any questions on that? The other thing we do is simply give them some basic facts around mental illnesses. And whoops, this, this one says one in five people will experience a mental health issue in their lives. These, these data haven't changed much. 20% um, of us have what we call an issue and 10% of us have a disorder. With the new DSM-5, I think it's gonna double because they've included so many more criteria for disorders. But basically, um, you can't ignore something that's happening to 20%, 10 or 20% of the population. And yet we do. The, mental, the amount of health care dollars that go into mental health is abysmal. And it's a warehouse treatment to this day, for the most part, unless you happen to have resources and ability to navigate the system. And when I used to work with abusive parents and disabled or, or disadvantaged families, they didn't know how to navigate the system, they did, and, and they grew up in a, where the system was a bad thing. So one of the things we did in our youth program, and we still do in this one, way back in the 90s we did it, was teaching the kids how to navigate the system, because the help seekers that we're trying to get them to use are also the enemy, right? If I say that my dad hits my mom, they're gonna take me, you know, my dad's gonna be taken away, put in jail again, won't come out, all sorts of stuff happens, right? Lose your job, no money, Mom gets depressed. So that's the reality. It's not so simple. So we want them to navigate the system, to know how to ask for help without setting off the alarm. And you and I know how to do it because we know the system. You would call up somebody and explain it in language that they'd understand, and you'd know how to do it. Right? If I you know, had a, a daughter or son that was showing signs, i know how to call somebody and explain it. They do not. They know how to complain, perhaps, and because of the way they're explaining it, they're going to get the police response, not the mental health response, right? So uh, how many times I, I've run into families where uh, they, they knew they needed help, but it was easier to pick up the phone and report your neighbor than it was to, all, to pick up the phone and ask for help. That's the system they live in, and we still live in. You know, it's all about reporting others. You can't ask for help. So. That's the reality of it. So part of what we teach them 
It's not a hard concept. It's to practice how to seek help. How do you make a phone call? We used to, in our previous program, we do some of that in this one. We have opportunities for the kids to role play or uh, develop situations um, such as they're a bit older and they're living with someone and they, um, they have maybe a criminal charge, they need some help, and they, they don't have any money, et cetera, et cetera. What do you do? Who do you talk to first? And the odd thing is most of the kids, what they, they always think money. So the first person I talk to is I go down to the welfare office. You know? So they have to do it. They actually have to go down to the welfare office, and we would call the welfare office and tell them this is part of a project. Their job is to learn how to talk to adults about real situations. Their name's Jane or John, and you know, and and uh, they would be able to see what it's like, or they do it on the phone. A lot of them did it on the phone. Not easy. If you're 16 years old, it's hard to even order a pizza by phone with an adult because they're gonna say, "What? What do you want on that?" And now the adult's saying, "What's wrong with you? Where are your parents?" And they don't know how to respond. So seeking help very difficult for the kids. And then we try to get them to practice that. And, and part of that concept is that uh, it may not be them, but in their lifetime, they will know someone. They will know someone who has these problems or some problem, and they were gonna, you're going to be the one that's going to help them, or you're going to be the one that makes it worse. So why don't more people get help? People think I'm weird and weak and crazy. There's nothing wrong with me. I don't think I need help. I'll snap out of it. These are the concepts that the kids would, whoops, would generate. <laughs> that thing. These are the concepts that kids will generate in their language. Whoops. Everyone feels like this, right? Or I don't know where to go to get help. There's so many roadblocks to help seeking that to have the right calling card is not easy. And if you have the wrong one, you get in trouble. Okay. We're, almost, we're getting to the end, and then we'll have a few minutes for any further discussion. I'm not going to keep you too long on a Friday night. And my brain has about two cells left. They're still firing. <laughs> I don't do full days too often anymore. So, um, so then we talk to them about the healthy relationship connection. That healthy relationships are a big part of a person's mental well-being. If you feel me meaningful, <coughs> meaningfully connected, um, you're in a much better position to access help and help other people. So it's a fundamental aspect that they can learn and that they can do and they, and they want to do, and it's part of health and well-being. Unhealthy relationships contribute to mental health issues, and mental, person's mental health can affect how they interact with people. So um, in the groups, when they're trying to problem solve, how do I deal with mental health issues, a fundamental thing we come back to is forming healthy relationships. The people that are around you, you care about them. Um, and they are your support. They are the ones that you're going to talk to first. You expect certain respect from them and vice versa. Um, so to try to break that notion that simply because I'm dating a girl that I can treat her that way. And that's a very important part of it. All right, I think we're getting to the end here. Um, young people armed with the right information can be in a great position to find them, to help themselves or a friend. And eight out of ten young people who attempt suicide mention their plans to someone, and often it's a friend. So these are the concepts that we teach to the people uh, running the groups, and then they translate it as part of the exercises in the program. This is not all of it, but it's a big part of it, um, so that we can talk about mental health without stigmatizing it, without talking about illness with giving them optimism that they can do things about it, that they do have charge over. Even if you have all sorts of negative things on your scorecard, you can build the positive side up. And sometimes the negative things give you more street cred, more capability, because you know it ain't good. I got to try. I got to do something different. So um, they work together on, on all that resolution. So let's turn to questions and do you have this information about our program in your handout as well and it's and feel free to email us. Mm -hmm. So in the out of school uh, delivery, it was done to small groups that they where they certain grades or age groups that they would have to be involved. Yes, I didn't mention the part one, part two part. <laughs> part one of the healthy relationship part uh, um, program is designed for as young as age twelve 
but typically ages uh, uh, 14, 15, 16. And part two is more advanced. It's for kids that have done part one and now can be a group leader in part two. So they would, um, they would be 15, 16, 17 year old kids and they can sit in with the counselor and do role plays and help out. And that's a big part of it. And I forget the rest of your question, I'm sorry. It was about the selection process. In the, um, in the plus one that you did in the after school environment, mm -hmm. were the kids certain, you know, were they those same age groups? Yes, yeah, so, you know, we like to keep them within two or three years of each other, because otherwise it's- Seventh grade, yeah. going as low as seventh grade. With that part, yes or no? Um, for the after school program, if they're young, as young as 12, the 12, 13, 14 year olds can go together, but no older than that, because they're dealing with different issues and they might not feel comfortable but with the older and younger kids. But they are mixed sex. You want boys and girls together. Um, but often you split them apart for certain exercises. You want the boys to talk with other boys about how they deal with this and girls to do the same. Then they. The fun part is bring them together and see what, how they differ or are similar. But uh, mm -hmm. with the after, uh, after school program, uh, how often did they? You know, I know with uh, the regular program, it was part of the integrated part of the community, uh, curriculum. But with the after school program, you know, how long did they meet and for how long a duration? And that's more flexible. So the the lessons are designed to be an hour apiece. The summer when we evaluate it, we're gonna do it two hours because um, it's in the summertime, they have more time and we're gonna run it two hours a day with breaks so it'll be about two and a half hours of their day. Um, but there's an advantage to doing it faster and more intensely because the kids get into it faster and, and such. Um, and the advantage of doing it over time is maybe they can grasp a little bit more and practice more. But I, at this point, I can't tell you which is better. We've done it both ways and both of them seem to be effective. We have not done the full evaluation of it like we're going to do this summer. So with the uh, after school program or the summer program, it's going to be every, it will be every day, five days a week for two hours a day. For how long is the duration? Two weeks, including the assessment period pre and post. It's, it's still 14 lessons. So um, including the breaks and the assessments, I think it's now actually 15 lessons. We added one since then. But uh, it takes them roughly 10 days hours each to get through it all by the time they do all their gathering and meeting. Mm -hmm. So the, the to, to be true to the fidelity of the program, it takes how many, a minimum of how many doses? 14? Yes. To be true to the fidelity, which I'm glad you mentioned. Yes, because you can't just jump in and jump out, although you could mix it up. You know, on Mondays you do this and on Tuesdays you do something else. It, it doesn't have to be delivered in a particular way. You just don't want to skip through it and pick and choose. Mm -hmm. You mentioned at the beginning that this should happen even younger and, and sort of across the developmental continuum. Are there plans that you're working on to go younger or are there other programs that you know about or respect mm -hmm. that, that start these types of concepts earlier? There are other programs. Most of the social emotional learning programs have been done with the younger kids. And most of them are focused on particular deficits. And the, the concern a lot of us have today is that we have to move away from deficit-based programming and look at the whole child. So um, by deficits, I'm, I am talking about specific problem behavior and, and often they're focused on conduct problems or um, that kind of thing. And that's taught us a lot and they're good programs. But now let's introduce them uh, with a different strategy towards uh, building assets in the kids. So my dream, and this is what I'm hoping to do, is now that we have the grade nine evaluated and the grade eight evaluated, and this grade seven is about to be evaluated in the next year, that we have enough strength to be able to say that it works. And the buy-in is strong in terms of educators, they get it and the parents get it. Uh, most of the community gets it. There's no extra cost involved in it, very little because Teachers are already there teaching. You don't have to pay for people to do it. The resources are cheap. It's done online. Um, there's no business you have to buy it from. So it's, we, we try to deliver it in a way that, that is sustainable. Now what we do is we're going to start writing the curriculum for younger grades. We're waiting for the Ministry of Education to um, 
either talk to us about their new curriculum guidelines or so we can modify them for them or we will adapt our program to fit them but eventually we want to have grades 1 through 12 or 1 through 8 at least 9 so that the kids are introduced to these concepts early on like I said earlier today that it's a very simple thing to teach kids around healthy relationships when they're little before they get into the stigma and the, and the fear of being uh, vulnerable and all that so it's <clears throat> all you need to do in the younger grades is 20 minutes of some of these exercises just a few things mindfulness training is being used in some of the schools today and uh, we can't say ours is a mindfulness program. We don't focus on, on uh, meditation aspects and that, which some of them do. But there's a lot of value in terms of just introspection, having little kids spend a few minutes to think about their values and to think about their feelings and, and these kind of things. It, there's a, a movement afoot for that. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any, um, is there any effort to integrate the program for the over age kids? Because you're talking about with in regards to the school system, you're talking about the grade levels. But what about <coughs> the over age kids that are in a certain grade level? Because there are instances where you're running to, you know, say in ninth grade or in eighth grade, 16 or 17 year old students. You know, and they they're more advanced, are they've already gone through some of these things that you only you know, is there any any plans for a modification of the curriculum for those kids? Are they kids that are there because they've gone through the system slowly or been held back? Ret retentions uh, are just kids that have been left behind because of, uh, it could be attendance, it could be uh, mobility issues, it could be uh, academic skills. You know, in, a lot, in, in this wonderful country of ours, if you don't pass the test in the third grade, you don't get promoted. Right. And it, you know, and if you don't pass that test two times, you'll be promoted two times. So by the time you get to the fourth grade, you could be ten you know. I can't say there's a, a program for we have the alt, alt ed program, which is for kids that aren't in the system. But uh, I think the kids that are older could potentially be in the same classes as the younger ones, as long as they were mature, you know, had similar levels of maturity, or they do the after school program, which can address older age kids much easier. I can't, you know, we, but we don't have one targeted specifically for what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. What do you do with uh, children who, for example, are, are streetwise kids versus children who are more protected and more innocent? And doesn't those two groups skew yeah. the results? Yeah, that's a good point. You may not mix them together if it's not a good match. Uh, both of those kids need different messages, perhaps, at that point in their life. So uh, usually the groups are formed by either an agency or someone who knows that I, we're working with this type of kid, this age of kid, so we're going to keep them together. But you, you don't want to mix and match too much because you never want to be teaching the bad skills to the good kids and vice versa. Well, you want to do vice versa. But you do have to protect them from that. And they would not, it wouldn't be a good blend, I guess. And just like if you had the really young kids and the older kids, it wouldn't work as well. What you really want to achieve is have the older kids <clears throat> that have gone through the program be the teachers as much as you can. We all like that mentoring method. But in order to do it in our program, they have to have gone through the program and be nominated by a counselor who's mature enough to do this, to give the right message, very important because they're going to have the weight of responsibility of these young kids looking up to them. And they can abuse that very easily if, if they chose to. So we have to make sure they're responsible. Have you done this in the United States? Pardon? Have you done this in the United States? I have not. We've, there's some people that have. Uh, it started in Seattle in an after-school program. That's where we developed it a few years back. Has not been evaluated in the United States. It originated, or its origins were back in the 90s with the youth relationship, so we evaluated that. But this is a really different program, focused less on just uh, dating violence and more on mental health and well-being and that kind of thing. But we're open to it. We're open to having people evaluate it, talk to people here about it, you know, if they're interested in using it in their programs and 
and modifying it culturally and whatever, we're very open to that. It's, we aren't really disseminating it widely until that's done. We're, we're really using it for people who are willing to do a bit of research on it, whether it's qualitative or not. Just give us some feedback. Uh, tell us how the kids are doing. Make sure that you monitor it so that, it's, uh, so that we can tell other people how effective it is. So um, I really appreciate your attention. I know it's difficult to sit and stare at one person all day. I at least had 50 people to stare at. So thank you very much for your attention, and I hope that was useful for you.